Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and I'm joined tonight by uh, Professor Dr. Dr. Wolfgang Streeck, which is a very special uh, pleasure to me because Dr. Streeck is somebody that I consider one of Germany's greatest political and social analysts of our time. Because when it comes to academics, Professor Streeck is about as top-notch as it gets. He was the director of the German Max Planck Institute for the Study of Societies. He published countless articles and books looking at the interactions of society and politics. Uh, for instance, Buying Time, The Delayed Crisis of Democratic Capitalism, or How Will Capitalism End? Essays on a Failing System. And most recently, he published Democracy at Work, Contract, Status and Post-Industrial Justice. He is also an adamant critic of European and transatlantic warmongering, and uh, and we want to discuss today uh, Germany's position in this ongoing proxy war in uh, Ukraine, something that I consider the latest uh, itineration of European stupidity. But um, I want to hear all of his thoughts. So, uh, Professor Streeck, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Professor Streeck, uh, in your recent article in the Austrian magazine uh, International, you radically criticized this new German notion of the Zeitenwende introduced by uh, your Chancellor Olaf Scholz, um, and you criticized it as nothing less than the end of peaceful coexistence. Could you, for our international viewership, uh, please explain what the Zeitenwende is for Germany, or for those who believe in it, and let us know your critique about it? Well, you see, the German post-war uh, uh, history was was one of uh, uh, yeah post-war uh, uh, pacifism, if you want. Popular uh, the popular notion that wars are uh, worse than uh, anything good that you can uh, achieve with them, uh, and that uh, international. Politics and policy has one overarching uh, general uh, need, uh, namely uh, to avoid uh, that uh, wars again uh, happen between countries. And this uh, uh, attitude uh, was uh, was ex extremely influential during the uh, era of Willy Brandt and later also. Helmut Schmidt, even Helmut Kohl, and um, rapidly, last the, the, the last year and the year before, this has sort of evaporated, and for to the astonishment of, of quite a few people, uh, Germany within um, a year's time became uh, willy nilly an active uh, member of the alliance uh, on the part of the West uh, in this uh, uh, Ukraine uh, conflict. And if, if you want to understand what is happening in Germany today, then, then the, the, this, this general change in attitude towards uh, uh, mil the military uh, war and so on, this is the important uh, thing uh, associated with uh, Zeitenwende. Can you give us a sense of like how big this this trend toward militarism is in numbers? I mean, with including the new budget that was created in order to kind of just feed the war economy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, they, they are very good at this. This this one hundred billion thing is uh, is now said to be. Uh, uh, almost uh, tiny compared to what they think they need or what they are being told uh, that they they need. So, so we hear now that uh, uh, th this budget has to be tripled, which which is <laughs> which is roughly two thirds of the federal budget for for one year. Um, now, of course, when it comes to to weaponry, 
uh, it takes some time to decide what you want to buy and from whom and and german engineers always want to buy the best possible stuff that you can get so <laughs> so now uh, uh, this money is hard, has hardly been spent at this point uh, and and that that's not a surprise because because part of it is going into for example uh, 35 F-35s. Why 35? I don't know. The, the thing is called F-35, which is the most modern American uh, fighter bomber, uh, which will be available maybe in three, four, five years, I, I guess even longer. And, and they, will, they say it costs 8 billion uh, euros, but uh, uh, realistically, I think you have to double, to double the price. Uh, the, see, Germany, Germany was uh, sort of for a very long time, or, or, or during the, the post-war period, Germany was uh, uh, not a, a, a nuclear uh, power because in the early 1960s it signed the anti the, the nuclear uh, anti-proliferation treaty uh, under strong pressure from the United States, which in exchange gave up some of the prerogatives of the uh, it, it had since 1945 since the occupation. Now, uh, uh, after this, there was always the question whether the United States would uh, use their uh, nuclear arms to defend uh, Germany in the case of a, of a war with uh, the, then the, the Soviet Union. In order to reassure the Germans, although they were never really reassured because, because this idea that the Americans would, let's say, sacrifice New York City for Berlin is, is a pretty bizarre idea. Uh, now, now what, they, what, what, what they then offered and what the Germans were, were willing to take was so-called nuclear participation on the part of the, of the Germans, which basically involves that they buy American planes, the Americans station American nuclear bombs on German soil, uh, and then they, to they tell the German Air Force, uh, just in case, uh, to, to, to take these bombs to places that the United States uh, assigns to them. That is called, so we have a little, a little, nuclear, <laughs> little nuclear capability, but let's say in a, in a very limited way. M most importantly, Germany in this sense has a nuclear veto, right? Germany can say we are not using these, these goddamn weapons because we're not going to fly them there. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not so sure <laughs> because uh, no, I, th I think that the details of, of this deal are uh, somewhere in the dark. Uh, you, you just don't know. But uh, what we do know is uh, an, an official number of uh, the, the, the official number of these, of these devices stationed on German soil, which is, uh, I think, a two digit number, 60 or 70. And and we know where the planes are, the the present planes, the tornadoes, but but the the exact uh, target catalog is is not known. Okay, then um, let me let me use this to ask you about this this um, this danger, this very real danger of nuclear escalation in Europe. I mean, during the Cold War, it was pretty clear, and especially to the Germans, that if there is ever a limited nuclear war fought with tactical nuclear weapons, it would be basically the end of the German nation because it would be certainly East Germany versus West Germany. It would eradicate everything and Europe would be the theater, right? Europe would be the one wiped out before Moscow shoots at Washington, Washington at Moscow. They yeah. will have like, you know, the, the satellites will destroy each other. And this was well understood. And this was one of the impetus for the weapons, you know, the, the kind of the de-escalation and Ostpolitik of Willy Brandt and like, let's de-escalate the European theater. Um, and that, that that was a very strong notion back then, I would say also popularly and uh, politically and popularly. And right now in 2023, as, as we speak, it seems that Germany seems so sure, especially, especially the former peace <laughs> activists, uh, the Greens, that, oh, no, this could never happen. This is this is ridiculous. Yeah. And as you write in your article, they are more worried about dangers of nuclear power plants than they are about nuclear bombs. Yeah. To why? Tomorrow How did they... that happen? Yeah, <laughs> if, I, if I only knew. To, we, we can speculate about it. You're right. Tomorrow they, they will switch off the last remaining nuclear power plants. 
but but uh, in Germany, it's an absolute taboo uh, to talk about uh, the uh, even the the sort of side effects of uh, tactical uh, nuclear weapons being used in the Ukraine war. It, it, everybody here is still scared stiff about uh, Chernobyl, uh, which which is basically <laughs> in the Ukraine. Uh, if if they started to use um, a battlefield nuclear arm, then then the 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 the, the fallout would would spread all over Europe, <laughs> and we would not not. Uh, it is never never talked about. Um, also, for example, uh, for example, if if you prepare really prepare for such a thing, then you would tell the population what to do in case. It happens. So, so for example, you would you would distribute uh, medications or iodide uh, tablets or something. Nobody's even talking about. Uh, I think. I think uh, this new generation of of uh, politicians. Uh, they, they had parents were uh, not in a war. Their grandparents, maybe, but they may not have met them uh, because they may have been dead uh, already before 1945. Uh, the, 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 there is no sense of the, uh, let, let's say, the, the proper dynamic, the, the, the eigen dynamic of a, of a war. See, you, you start a war and you think that you have a, a certain objective, and, and usually they think. It takes three or four months, and and the thing is done. And usually, wars take a very, very, very much longer. And and then at the end, nobody knows um, what what it was for, for which one had started this thing, because wars feed on themselves. Yes. But this experience is totally, totally absent. And and there is a belief that with uh, proper weaponry and with proper sort of motivation, uh, you can use a war uh, to achieve something uh, virtuous as opposed to uh, by, by defeating evil so that uh, the good uh, wins. Yeah? You take an, and, and for this, you take an unbelievable chance that um, the thing will drag on for, forever. Right now, they say that 17,000 young uh, Ukrainian men have in the meantime died uh, on the battlefield. 17,000. Now, now we hear that the war is going to continue for at least one more year. That seems to be the American estimate. Uh, and, and the weapons that they use have become much, much bigger and, and much more effective. So maybe at the end, 50,000 young people would have died. What for? <laughs> and the, for the return of, of the Crimean Peninsula to, 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 to the state of Ukraine. Uh, now, in order to justify this sort of, this sort of uh, uh, sacrifice, you have to, you have to blow up uh, the, the rhetorically uh, what the war is all about, all about. Now it is about defeating a second Hitler who who is a madman uh, in in the in the in the Kremlin, and who wants to not just uh, uh, commit a genocide on the Ukrainians, but after he would have done that, he will have start uh, invading uh, the Scandinavian countries, Germany and France, in order to uh, uh, to to conquer them, and these are the stories that people. It, it is uh, crazy, they, but this is crazy. I mean, this is a crazy, crazy notion. And and how is it possible that so many people believe this? It is so utterly ridiculous. Yeah. And the viewer of this channel, a lot of people are not from the collective West or the ones yeah. who are, are the ones who have see things. And yeah, it is yeah. so incredibly stupid. How is it possible that we believe something like this or that, that a large part believes it? And it got it gets dumber and dumber. We're asked yeah. to believe that Russia shoots at its own prisons, blows up its own pipelines, that they uh, it, that this is so dumb. How is it possible? Yeah. Now, now, in a sort of moralistic way of the of, uh, 
view of the world. There's, there's empires of, of evil and, and evil empires and good empires, and, and you want to be on the right side. Uh, most importantly, I think this whole story is politically completely decontextual, decontextualized in the yes. sense that uh, what people observe is this guy Putin uh, marching into, <laughs> into Ukraine. The entire prehistory is not just unknown, it is considered morally irrelevant. Moreover, moreover, uh, if you start talking about it, you run the risk of being designated uh, by uh, uh, the, the, the mainstream as a so-called Putin versteher. Sometimes who try, someone who tries to understand what this guy Putin is up to. Now, as a sociologist and and um, uh, someone who has studied Max Weber in, in intensively. Uh, Verstehen du Soziologie, sociology that understands uh, motivations, is the core of everything. You have to understand what someone does. Otherwise, as, as Weber says, the only thing that remains is to declare the other side to be uh, mentally uh, in, incapable. Uh, it, that yeah. is what, be, what is being done. At the same time, we are told that as mad as this guy is, uh, he is not so mad to use his nuclear arm. That, this is an absolute contradiction. And, uh, and, and the charge of being a Putin versteher, somebody who understands Putin and loves Putin, comes from people who will tell you that they exactly know what Putin wants, which is yeah, total yeah. conquest and domination. So, ha but this is such a this double standard or this 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 incoherence of that logic seems so blatantly clear yeah. to, to me and others and you too and then there's a large part of the population that don't manage to see that do you have a, an idea why sociologically this is possible to kind of create such a thick uh, uh, smoke screen yeah <laughs> uh, it's a particular pathology and, and uh, I, I would think that, see, if, if, if you look at, at survey data, then um, uh, what you see is that among the young people, uh, there is a majority who are not in favor of uh, sending heavy arms to, uh, to, to Ukraine. Mm. But, but among this uh, group, those who are politically interested, and among the young, very few still are, uh, who vote for either uh, the uh, FDP or the Greens, uh, they are interestingly convinced that uh, negotiations, uh, even the third party intervention, uh, even the offer of um, uh, security guarantees, neutrality, and so on, all these things that are being discussed in the United States openly, where, where in the United States everybody is convinced that after this war, uh, Ukraine will not again uh, own uh, uh, the, the Crimean Peninsula. But everybody knows that um, the result of that war will not be Ukraine an official being an official member of NATO or the, or the, or the European Union. So uh, that it will be that will will have to be a federal structure that gives the Russian speaking areas some sort of of autonomy. That this is roughly what this war is going to be about. But you say that here, here, our foreign minister believes that uh, the the only uh, moral uh, objective of the war can be to capture Putin and take him to Den Haag uh, to, to have him stand trial in the International Criminal Court. Yeah, that, that is such a co complete, absolutely complete madness, even, even if, if the guy, as far as I'm concerned, you, you could take him to that court and you could take George, George Bush Jr. with him. They, they could both be yeah, for, for breach of, of international law as far as I'm concerned. For this to happen, every reasonable human being can, can calculate 
how many people will have to die, if at all, in order for the Germans or the Ukrainian troops showing up in, in, in Moscow and apprehending um, Vladimir Putin. Yeah, it is, it, it, you, <laughs> millions of people would have to die. So, so, so it cannot be a reasonable objective of this war to have Putin stand trial in an international criminal court. In, in exactly the same way in which, unfortunately, you can say unfortunately, in which, unfortunately, it cannot be an objective of international policy to have George Bush uh, stand trial in the, in the same way, yeah? who lied to uh, the uh, Security Council mm -hmm. to tell them that there, are of, that there were weapons of mass, mass destruction uh, in, in, in Iraq, which everybody knew that they were not. And I think, I think the, the number is, is 800,000 or 1 million, 1 million people died. 1 million people yeah. dying in, 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 in the Iraq war. Yeah. And Iraq and, is still in shambles. Still oh yeah, like no, horrible, no. worse than before. Uh, no, they, my prediction is that next year, as the American electoral campaign will begin, and as uh, America will begins to get uh, real serious, where they have real interests, which is in the Pacific and, and, and in relation to China, that at this point, they will simply go home and leave the Ukraine and Europe to their own devices. And these devices, uh, the way things are, will be German devices. So, so uh, what I see coming is that um, the United States are slowly getting ready to turn over the uh, uh, military leadership for this, um, uh, for this proxy war uh, to, to Germany uh, being pushed forward by countries like Poland and the, and the, uh, the Baltic states. Um, the, the French sort of looking on. <laughs> mm. And, and, and uh, uh, if then, uh, if then this war ends in a disaster, uh, it will be the Germans uh, who will be blamed because they didn't send enough troops, they didn't send enough uh, weapons, they didn't send enough money. There's already the idea that, that Europe will have to pay for the re rebuilding, the reconstruction of, of, of Ukraine. As Frau von der Leyen said, it, it will be more beautiful than ever. Afterwards, you imagine which, which, which you know, I mean, if if the if Germany and the European use, Union used hundreds of billions of uh, euros to reconstruct Ukraine, I have yeah. no problem with that whatsoever. That's a good use yeah. of that money. That's a beautiful use. Let's yeah. please do yeah. that. Uh, the problem is when you use that in order to destroy everything because you want to kill more Russians because the Russians need to die. That's that's like this this psycho uh, yeah, psychology at the moment. You first, you first have to have to sort of help them uh, to continue the war rather than uh, uh, seeking a settlement. See the 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 Ukraine. The, I I also have nothing. I'm I'm not really against uh, uh, helping a country, uh, even with military means, that has been uh, invaded by another country, provided you have some influence on the uh, objective of the defense. Well, where, uh, where is the point where the government of the country that is being attacked will be willing to say that they have now reached their objective and they are willing to talk? Mm -hmm. Now, if you listen to what the Ukrainian government has to say, then it is, uh, we can have negotiations any day provided the Russians leave every inch of Ukrainian uh, territory that they entered since 2014, and then we can negotiate. So oh, that, that means that's a recipe for unending continuation of the war. Now, 
Now, if there was a reasonable prospect that this war can be won and that they can achieve this situation, then I would be, uh, I, I, I would about it. But if they think that they want to sacrifice uh, uh, so many young people and, um, and their, ways of, their way of life, their, place, their city for this purpose, then I, I would not basically be able to, to tell them not to. But, but they don't seem to not, or their government seems to, to be willing to, um, uh, to make these, uh, these sacrifices for an entirely unrealistic goal. And that, that gives me, and then we are supposed, we are, we are supposed to help them do that without having any uh, uh, role in determining what the uh, final objective of that war uh, is to be. Yeah. The, uh, um, it did. the 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 entire idea that let me put it this way there is some psychological mechanism at play that i wonder about and maybe you have insight in that which is this narrative that we hear in the west and in germany is particularly strong about the we have to win the war or we have to support i mean your foreign minister mrs Baerbock, actually said we are at war right she used that that phrase yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and there's a there's a whole psychology about we have to achieve this but it's of course not we it's the young ukrainian men who kill yeah, young yeah, yeah, russian yeah, yeah, yeah. men and slaughter each other and die and and what we do is is have this feel good rhetoric in the west about we are so virtuous and virtue virtuous is the sending of weapons and we are at the point where nato general yeah. secretary stoltenberg literally said weapons are the way to peace which is like so grotesque but this uh, absolutely makes sense to some people yeah it's absolutely grotesque and 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 that aspect of it that reveals a sort of very strange cynicism. So, so now in Germany, the the green um, politicians who who are now uh, bellicose as as you would never have, have imagined, they all all of them have refused to serve in the German army. They they are uh, um, the, the, the conscientious objector to military to military service. None of them, none of them has ever served. Uh, it, under the draft system, um, it, and then at the same time, uh, the rhetoric is that uh, uh, these heroic Ukrainians who are dying for our values, yeah. Sentence is, of course, we will never send troops uh, to Ukraine. Uh, everything, all that we send is weapons and money. And be assured, German electorate, be assured that we will not send troops. Now, if they are dying for our values, we cannot, <laughs> we cannot watch them die without coming to their help. And, and if it's our values is, is to die for them, then why do we not join them? Yes, and, and I think, I think uh, as... Uh, Again, this this Frau von der Leyen once said that uh, the they now have by sacrificing for our value, they now have deserved uh, to be invited to join the European family. This is going to backfire I, I, so dramatically. You know, arming Ukraine to the teeth. And maybe yeah. like including a system like that with the political system as it is, this is going to, this might blow up the European Union. You, you, we can already see.